Well, you know, I love being flatteringly introduced, but Glenn exceeded all my expectations. He also stole the conclusion of the talk you're about to hear uh, from something I published elsewhere, and you're going to have to hear it again, but it's all right, it's worth hearing again. I've often said, and I say again in this book, that never have I been asked any question on any subject as many times as I've been asked why most Jews are liberals, or in its more specifically political form, why most Jews keep voting for the Democrats. But this question immediately gives rise to another question, which is why so many people, and especially non-Jews, are so puzzled by the political attitudes and behavior that predominate among American Jews. After all, up until the end of World War II, no one would have wondered why most Jews were liberals or why they were so committed to the Democratic Party, because the answer would have seemed self-evident. In those days, most American Jews were poor. And this meant that the Democratic Party, which spoke for the interests of people in their socioeconomic condition, was their natural political home. In those days, too, Jews suffered from various forms of discrimination. And this made it inevitable that they would look upon liberal ideas as being good for them. This, indeed, had been the case for centuries. The ancestors, both immediate and distant, of the vast majority of American Jews lived in Europe, where the forces that favored the emancipation of the Jews and the granting of civil rights and liberties to them had always been located somewhere on the left side of the political spectrum. And in 20th century America, especially after the ascension of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the closest counterpart to these forces was the Democratic Party. Conversely, the political right seemed to represent an American version of the conservative forces in Europe, which had always opposed equal rights for Jews. It made perfect sense then for Jews to align themselves with the left and to keep their distance from the right, where they were in any case unwelcome. But then something momentous happened that began to rob these political commitments of the sense they had always made. This momentous event was the Six-Day War of 1967. To be sure, even before 1967, in the decades following the end of World War II, Jews found themselves getting more and more out of political step with the other white members of the Roosevelt Coalition. The attachment of these non-Jewish ethno-religious groups to the Democrats was steadily declining in direct proportion to the improvement in their economic and social condition, but not the Jews, a substantial majority of whom kept on voting for the Democratic candidate in every presidential election. It was this phenomenon that gave rise to Milton Himmelfarb's deservedly famous epigram. Jews, he said, earn like Episcopalians and vote like Puerto Ricans. <laughs> in, short, in short, I told you it was deservedly famous. In short, by 1967, the Jewish commitment to the Democratic Party was already an anomaly from a socioeconomic point of view. And so far as discrimination was concerned, most of the barriers against Jews had already been toppled. The principle that was responsible for this development was the belief that justice required individuals to be treated on their own merits as individuals without regard as the old liberal catechism we used to recite when I was a kid in public school, without regard to race, color, creed, or country of national origin. But by 1967, this formerly sacred liberal principle was giving way among liberals to a new conception of social justice that entailed the reintroduction of the kind of quota system that had always been used as a way of keeping Jews out and down. And then came the Six-Day War. In the weeks leading up to it, President Nasser of Egypt 
and the leaders of the other Arab countries bordering Israel issued a steady stream of blood-curdling threats to destroy Israel and drive its Jewish inhabitants, as Nasser put it, into the sea. Thus, for the second time in the 20th century, and only a quarter of a century after the first, a major community of Jews was threatened with annihilation, actual annihilation. And once again, the world, as it seemed, stood complacently by. The difference, the literally earth-shaking difference, was that this time, Jews living under a genocidal threat had the means and the will to defend themselves against it. And so the Israelis did. In six short days, they averted another Holocaust by waging one of the most brilliant campaigns in military history. Most American Jews celebrated that victory. But on the left, and especially among the intellectuals who made their political home there, the outcome of the Six-Day War gave anything but cause for celebration. On the contrary, the Israeli victory became the occasion for an outbreak of what called itself anti-Zionism, but that was more often than not the cover for a new species of anti-Semitism, through which the old hatred that had from time immemorial been directed at the Jewish people was now directed at the Jewish state. In the process, the libelous charges that anti-Semites had always hurled at Jews living in the diaspora were being translated into the language of international affairs and applied to the Israelis. When some of us sounded the alarm over this ominous development, we were accused of trying to fend off any criticism of Israel's policies by smearing it as anti-Semitism. This ploy is still being used, but as the years have passed and as the new anti-Zionism has spread like a metastasizing malignancy through the major institutions of the liberal culture, the universities, the mainstream media, the world of the arts and entertainment, not to mention the UN, it has become harder and harder to maintain the pretense that there's any significant difference between the new anti-Zionism and the old anti-Semitism. Thus it came about that the political left, which had for so long and with good reason commanded the loyalty of the Jews, was now offering hospitality to ideas and sentiments that were blatantly hostile to Jews. To cite only one of the many examples I discuss in my book, The Nation, perhaps the most influential magazine of the American left, and that had once upon a time been a staunch supporter of Israel, could now publish an article by the novelist and critic Gore Vidal in which Israel was described as, in his words, a predatory nation busy stealing other people's land in the name of an alien theocracy, and in which he denounced American Jews, all American Jews, as an Israeli fifth column. It was bad enough that a major liberal periodical like The Nation could play host to this naked invocation of two of the classic themes of anti-Semitism, the Jew as a disloyal alien and the Jew as a conspiratorial manipulator of malign power dangerous to everyone else. But what was even worse was that Vidal's article elicited no more than a weak peep of protest from the magazine's sponsors and readers. The Vidal affair provided powerful confirmation for the argument some of us had been making since 1967 that anti-Semitism had found a new home on the left. And then, by a lucky coincidence, the nation's opposite number on the right, National Review, became embroiled in a similar controversy of its own that provided commensurately powerful evidence for the argument we had also been making since 1967 that anti-Semitism was becoming more and more unwelcome among conservatives. This controversy involved a member of...